Hello, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started with our third Thursday meeting for whatever this is, April. And today we have a guest speaker, but first we have a few things that we're going to go over. Uh, there's going to be another photo walk coming up this week, and Gary will tell about that. I'll come stand up here so he doesn't have to turn the camera. Um, so howdy. So we have another photo walk coming up a week from Sunday. We're going to go to Bartlett again, since our first outing to Bartlett in February, I believe, was rained out. Uh, cool place, but it was very, very moist, and nobody wants that. Uh, so we're going to meet out in Bartlett on the last Sunday of the month. I've got my dates correct. Yes. Um, at six o'clock, we'll wander around for about an hour and a half or so. Uh, the sunset is scheduled to be at 830 that evening, if I remember correctly. So we got plenty of light. Uh, lots of great photographic material. Uh, lots and lots of fun. A uh, few of us that made it out and braved the weather had a good time. Uh, so I think I think it will be a great opportunity to wander around a very interesting place. So we look forward to seeing you there. Um, and Georgetown to Bartlett was about 20 minutes, if I remember correctly. So from Round Rock, maybe about 25 to 30. So leave enough time. It's about 15 minutes north of Taylor. So just to give you an idea. So from there, uh, I remember everything. I don't know if you want to just mention a little bit about what the town was like. This oh. town... Well, okay. Just so if, if Carol were here, she could correct me because she knows a little bit more about the history than I do. Uh, so Bartlett has been the scene for a number of movie shoots. And about 20 years ago, they had some film company come in to do a movie. I forget the name of the movie. Uh, they decided to enhance the town to make more town that looks like the town. I want to say probably a 50s vibe. And so they built all this stuff. And then as movie studios do, they walked away and left everything there. So what you get to see might be original, might be built by the movie studio. We don't really know. Um, we do know that the brick roads that are the intersection of uh, Evie and I should I should have that memorized by now. <laughs> Anyways, the, br the brick roads, uh, the intersection uh, are original. Uh, from when the town was built. Uh, so so there's definitely stuff there that goes way back to when the town was founded. Um, but apparently other films have been shot there as well, so we don't know what's been added, but lots of really great stuff. Uh, you will find lots of really cool things there. Are you going to add uh, an album for the last one we did and for this one? Thank too? you, yes. So uh, in, 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 in the interest of encouraging sharing of our photographs, we are trying to set up galleries on the NAPFS website where you can upload some of your images. Uh, we had one for this, uh, what was the last one was? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, well, no, the Georgetown one I don't think is up yet. Okay, but so, okay, so I've been- Fast Drop, I think there was one, and the last time we went to Bartlett, I think. Right, was so I need to get one for the Georgetown poppies, and we'll set up one for uh, Bartlett as well. Uh, so we can get, get take take some of your shots that you want to share and let people see them. Uh, seems to be a pretty good way for people to uh, go to one spot and see what other people have done, right? As opposed to putting albums on Facebook and things like that. So uh, thank you for the reminder of that. Uh, I will do that when I get home. I will get those built when I get home. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely get your stuff out there and share it. Uh, but we'll have that ready to go before the walk this time <laughs> instead of after. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay. Patrick has something he wants to say. Uh, yeah. So, um, whoops, almost tripped over, going backwards. Okay. Uh, I shot a, a gentleman this afternoon, photographed him this afternoon, and he has a uh, foundation that is in Round Rock. And so his foundation has a significant something to do with the 4th of July parade in, uh, in the town. He, there were a couple of different invitations offered to me, but one of them was, would you like to have a vendor booth? And I thought, well, sure, why not? But I thought I'd ask you guys if you would be interested. I mean, we're talking like a half a day max, maybe a one day at the most, uh, setting up, the, He's he'll even supply the 10 by 10 pop-up tent for us. So um, if you'd like to be, 
included in that or have an interest in maybe selling something and manning the booth for a couple of hours during the parade and after the parade, uh, get a hold of me either after the meeting here so that I can say, yes, we want to do this, uh, or uh, definitely contact me by mail, you know, email or, or phone something, because I want to get back to them uh, so that we can get things moving if we wish to do that. And we will set it up as a club thing and um, we'll figure out how, we'll figure out if, if, you know, if anybody sells anything, yay. <laughs> we'll figure out how to get the money to you. So uh, I'll put it that way. So that, that's what I got. So there you go. All right, thanks. Okay, now, John, if you'll come up. Here's a clicker. So John is one of our members and he's going to talk to us today about uh, going on uh, photographic tours and stuff and how he uh, moved from just feeling like an, like an amateur to being able to call himself a photographer now. So uh, take it from there. All right, thank you. First off, I'm not a professional speaker, so let's get that out front. Um, when they first, Patrick first approached me, he talked about talking to me about talking about tours because I do this year alone, less than I'll go to 14 countries or 12 countries. I can't remember. We, we travel a lot for photography and I thought I'd start talking about tours and how I selected them, but I thought a lot of people may find that a little boring. So I thought I would share my photographic journey because I mean, let's, I felt like a poser in photography forever. And, and so I retired two years ago. I was a custom home builder for quite a few years. And before that, I was a realtor. Been married to Leslie for 38 years. And I was blessed because I've got a partner that is great doing crazy things. I mean, we, we were both pilots. We both have commercial rated pilot's licenses. For about 10 years, we were race pilots, cross country race pilots. And it was a circuit and professionally did for prize money and all that. And and um, so we've done some, some fun, interesting things that are a little bit different. And uh, we've also traveled. I've, uh, we just got back to Antarctica. So that was number seven on the continent. So over 60 countries that have been to so far. And Leslie's also an accomplished photographer. She, uh, y'all have seen her work in the contests and things. So she's at a show, right? I mean, a, a tour in Philadelphia with a, this amazing flower photographer. She just does these spectacular things. So Leslie's doing a, a little workshop in Philadelphia at the Longwood. Yes. Yeah. And just, she's been sending some incredible pictures so I think maybe for the macro one, you all see some. <laughs> um, one of the things, let me go online. One of the problems I had, I started doing photography when I was about 15 or 16 years old. I always felt like a poser. I just, I took pictures. I love to take pictures. I think I did okay looking at the eye. You know, look, my eye was good. And I was able to, take, I think, decent pictures. I had an old Nikromat. I've been using Nikon my whole life. And a funny thing happened. There was a show throughout the state of Texas and was put on by the Eamon Carter Museum. And they had all these photographers that submitted three images. And what they do is they select what they thought were the top three images. And then they would show them for a month at the Eamon Carter Museum. Well, it actually ended up being a pretty big deal because I think it opened up with another show, but they had the Symph Fort Worth Symphony that came and, and played for it and all that. Well, I got three of my photos got selected. And I'll never forget, I think at the, at the time I was like 20, 21 years old, and I met the other photographers. And man, they were going on about their aperture settings and about you know what this f-stop and what they did to get this effect and all that and and looked at me and he looks at one of the pictures said tell me about this one and I thought man I just saw a pretty picture and I stood in my light meter and took the picture that was it I was so embarrassed I never I put my camera up for probably five years didn't didn't take it back out and ever since then I've been insecure. I started doing underwater photography. I loved underwater photography. 
And I, I think I did some really nice things. And only thing I ever entered were on the ships. And I usually did fairly well on, on the contests on the ships. But I'd print my prints, and they all went in the closet. I had hundreds of photographs in my closet. I wouldn't even show anybody. In fact, my, my wife one day found them and said, what's this? What's this? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> so it was always an insecurity thing for me. So I finally, when I retired, I thought, I love photography. I'm going to get back into photography. So I went in and I started doing like what most people do, go on YouTube, watching, picking like two or three people that they, you know, Nigel Danson was one of the ones that, I don't know if anybody knows him, but followed him along and Mark Denny and started learning how to work with digital cameras. I really enjoyed it, but I wasn't really getting good results going around town. So I finally said, I'm going to go out and try to go on a photo tour. And I overstepped a little bit here, but everything I tried and tried and tried, it just wasn't getting the results that I wanted. So I finally, um, two of the issues I was running into is I really wasn't interested in things I was photographing. And plus the, lax, the um, lack of proximity to the things that I wanted to at that time. I didn't, it's interesting because you have to develop an eye to where you can go in. And I'm starting to work more and more with trying to find things in my neighborhood, which I think, you know, is important to do. I bought a little Aroloflex and I'm starting to use that. <laughs> Excited. Um, two of the things that photography did is it fulfilled two of my biggest passions, which is travel and also photography. And the first one I did with a, was with a gentleman named um, Christoph Fisher. And Christoph is an interesting fellow. He's in, uh, out of Toronto and he's a, um, physicist that turned into photographer and let me tell you his work is spectacular it's all landscapes he really 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 is wonderful he's just a really nice guy so i signed up and went to um lake louise and the bomb with him and he taught me so much and uh it was getting up two hours before sunrise one of my funnest stories was i, I think i submitted um moraine lake photo a while back and for one of the contests and, and we went in and we literally on the side of the lake at two two hours before the sun came up i mean we drive and it's an hour drive to get there so two hours we're on the side of lake Moraine. i'm thinking going christoph what the heck you know this is kind of early he said trust me beautiful spot we're all you know set up taking start taking photos 30 minutes before the sun came up and everything and finally he said now you want to know why we're here two hours early? And I said, yeah, why? I said, look behind you. And I went up, had been 100 photographers up on the hill. He says, because we beat them. And that was his philosophy. I don't know, I thought it was a funny story. Um, but we also were there for every sunset and then for classes and critiques and things along those. I started producing, I think, a little better photograph, but I'm still was nervous around critiques. And we did critique sessions. This was one of the Lake Moraine photos that we took. And that was like 30 minutes before sunrise. And this, um, it's still the highlights are a little high on this one. And then just, it was just beautiful photos and sunsets and sunrises and things like that. Um, this is when I started developing my identity as a travel photographer. It was fulfilling needs I had. It was coming back. I was doing it. I still haven't. I'm still working on the the post processing. Please interrupt if you have any questions. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard of Richard I. Anson. He he has a Netflix. I don't think anybody's seen the Tale of Light series, which is incredible. He does. He's specialist in Himalayas, and every single lonely planet book has ever been written has anything to do with photography plus the travel photography book was written by richard he's australian and um he's uh, just just an incredible guy but he he wrote this in his book and i copied it um, because i shoot so many different subjects it's difficult to define a specific style my aim is to match the subject with the best light and then the compose the elements to produce vibrant images that capture the reality of the moment. I aim to take strong individual images, but always conscious of how the pictures can build on each other to create a comprehensive coverage of the subject. 
event or destination. So the viewer, viewer gets a sense of what it might be like to experience it for themselves. Ideally, I'm aiming to add something new to help people perceive a place and the people who live there. In my book, that sums up travel photography completely. In fact, I started doing it really focusing on that when we were in Bangkok. Leslie to, enjoys my street photography, but not as much. She loves the tight, you know, portraits. I like the scene. I don't care about the portrait so much. I, I want to see somebody in a scene that tells a story. And so what I started focusing on is trying to make my photos, like on the street photography, look like you're standing in front of there and you're experiencing Bangkok or you're experiencing Namibia or you're experiencing these things for yourself. And to me, that's kind of what travel photography was. And it was interesting. I was with um, Richard in Bhutan and we were talking about it. And I was talking about the evolution I've been going through. And he said, John, you're a travel photographer. That's what you do. That's, that's your identity. And that sunk in. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. And from that point, I started feeling like I'm a photographer. I don't know how many times I took pictures of birds in flight or something. And, and I look at it and I look at you guys' photos and I think, oh, what the heck? I mean, why? I should put my camera back up. You know, <laughs> it just is always someone is better at something that's also generous to help you learn. But it, this gave me a chance to say, this is something I think I'm good at and I'm decent at, and it's my niche. I still strive to take some good birds in flight, but that may come one day. Um, but Richard is the one that helped me define what a travel photographer was and, you know, pretty much figure that was who I was. Elements of travel photographers. I think it kind of breaks down into five different categories for me. You've got the landscape. What's the landscape like? Landscape can be anything from, you know, the mountains with the clouds rolling over to, I don't know, it's uh, probably more architectural, but things like train stations, or I had one here. Oh, well, I'll show it later. Or like this is a zon at night in, um, in Bhutan. And things like that, to me, that's architecture and landscape. They kind of fit in together. People, I love taking photos of people. I kind of like it both ways. Some, some photographers, the last thing they want is somebody looking at them and smiling or going like this, which everybody in the world does. I kind of like that, but I also like it when I catch them in the natural state where they don't notice me and all that. Um, street Street to me is sharing a scene, something, someone to really be able to see and understand. And I've got some photos I'll show in a second of, of what that means. And I apologize, I'm going through this pretty quick. Culture, culture is interesting. And I was in Bhutan and it's a Buddhist culture. And we were, it was incredible because we were invited to these beautiful um, festivals. And it was just incredible, the color, the, the, the pageantry, the the monks and their dancing, and it, it it was just breathtaking. And the thing was, we were there when Bhutan's just opening up, so there weren't any tourists, and we would be in this spectacular zone, and it's these dancers and all around are the Bhutanese people, and there hardly any photographers. I didn't have to crop out one person with a camera behind somebody, <laughs> so oh, that was a big plus. And then wildlife, although I'm not there yet, I'm going back to Namibia in four weeks. I'm going to this time do a little bit better job on, on my elephants and things. So, but that to me is also a travel photographer. This is, um, I'll talk about some of the places we've been, been to. This is Namibia. And I don't know, I like this photo a lot better than most people do. It just was beautiful. The sun was starting to come up. It was coming through the uh, Namibia. We went... And I'll talk a little about the trips we did. This was interesting. I don't know if anybody's been to Namibia, but most of the people go to the southern part of the country where there's a whole northwestern section, the Nanib Desert, that nobody goes to. It's it's literally four-wheel drive Jeeps, and you're off, off the end of the world. And um, I had a chance to go there. And 
we were for two weeks living in tents, four wheel drives down dirt roads and over passes or just nothing but rocks. And one of the funniest things is it was so desolate. The way they marked the intersections for the dirt roads were with 55 gallon barrels that they painted. So you'd sit there and go, well, we're going to this place. So we go to the white barrel, turn right, go 50 miles to the blue barrel, turn left. And th that's how you, you navigated. It was really, it was different. And uh, it was fun because we didn't see people. It was like two weeks. We were tracking elephant herds down dry riverbeds. We were tracking, you know, we saw so many elephants. It was almost, we get to a point where we go, oh God, not more elephants, you know. Didn't see any zebras though. Another landscape. Um, probably everybody knows this one. This is this is uh, Iceland vesper horn. Took that this year. No, last year. We were we got lucky when we were in Iceland because it was when the volcano was going off, and. We just we went off, and when we were first there, we went from there to Norway, and then we came back on the ship, and they shut it down while we were there, so we didn't think we could do it. So we had two days when we got back off the ship in Iceland, and um, they opened it up. So we ran, and it was like, God, it's like a six-mile hike, or six in and six miles out. But boy, it was incredible. You come up on the side of this hill, and there's this volcano, probably 150, 200 yards, just shoot from you this was it was really really exciting this is bhutan this is what i was talking about this is um and um tim fu i know yeah i think it's tim fu this is the largest suspension bridge this is just gives you to me it tells you so much of the country the rice fields the mountains the um, if you notice the buildings here they're all similar the country map mandates that the construction needs to be in this style this Bhutanese style so every house every building every hotel is in this style interesting the people of Bhutan they, they have a king and man they love their king incredible but he dictates the clothing they wear so they have to wear traditional clothing when they go to work so everybody's in the traditional you know, uh, the clothing of the Bhutanese people, both the men and women. And um, it's it's fascinating because it's a country that did not open up again until I think 1985 was the first time they started letting foreigners into the country. <clears throat> Yet everybody speaks English. They're taught English in the schools. It's really amazing. And, and the people were gracious and they only let so many, if you get an opportunity, it's, it's a, it's gorgeous country. It's uh, just North of India and South of China. So next to Nepal. And this to me is like, I lump ar architecture and landscape kind of, I lump them together. So that's kind of landscape to me, but this was uh, in Bangkok and this is, um, can't remember the name of the train station. I remembered it this morning. I think I'm just nervous. <laughs> so, but this was, this was, this is what I'm talking about. Leslie entered the differences, how I look at things, and Leslie looks at, Leslie entered one of the contests, the same man, but she entered just the head. And I don't. I think she, I don't know where we got. She did okay on it. I don't know what her position was. But to me, I wanted this. I wanted to show. You look at this and the story this guy tells. I mean, he's probably. Well, he's probably my age. Yeah, but his hands. He works hard. He's in there having lunch, and it's just taking a break. It just tells you a whole story. He's at the market, and uh, and this was in Oaxaca. We went to um, the Day of the Dead this year. And uh, that was amazing. If you get a chance, just don't go with the tour group I went with. <laughs> this is one of the things that I've I've done is we do a lot of photo tours. But I, I find myself in cities for like two or three days. If I'm going to Bhutan or like we're going to Namibia or we're going to the, 
and I can't don't ask me to say them, the five stands, the Turkish stand, uh, all those were going there in August. And so I'll stop in Dubai for three to four days to start helping myself get past the jet lag before I go on and get started on the trip. And so what I've started doing is researching and finding photographers that are local photographers and hiring them and taking them. This is a uh, this is um, Juan Pablo. Juan Pablo is fantastic. It's amazing, amazing. And this is one of the things that I think really enjoy. I find most exciting. He took us through the markets, and and he's Oaxacan, and or Wakano as he says. And so he talks to people. He gets you set up. It, it, it's just amazing things. And this was him. I just had to include it, but. That's gotten to be one of the most exciting ways that I'm seeing things because I'm seeing the city with the eyes of people that are locals. I went with, um, that was the only tour I've ever taken that was bad was the Oaxaca. And I won't mention the company or anything. It's just with the, the tour leader. We did not get along very well. Um, and they went, and I don't know if you know what the Day of the Dead is, is where they go and they wait for the, the, the deceased family members to come, and then they go and take them home, and they have the vigil at the graveyards and all. And tour group had two nights where we were doing that, going to see the vigil. We went the first night, and I'm sorry, it was, there was these spectacular graves with all the, um, uh, the lights, all the candles, and the people eating, and just, but there were, for every person at this grave, there were 10 tourists. And man, they were walking up with their iPhones right in their faces. And here's people that are, you know, this, I, I'll never forget. I watched, I came up and there was a, a grave of a child. And the, the mother and father, you know, there's the mother and father. And they had the little iPhone playing lullabies and, and little kid songs. And they had toys all over the thing and they were being joyful because their child was coming back to them to spend two days there's no way i was taking a photo of that i mean i'm sorry but i connected with them a little bit and smiled and we said hello and talked a little bit but i watched people come up taking with their iphones taking pictures i just felt so uncomfortable i put my camera up well the next night i was talking to juan pablo and he said john go with me she said, don't, don't do this. Go with me. And so I, yeah. So we went and we went to a local cemetery, a smaller one. And there are still tourists there, but there weren't that many. But this was the benefit of having a local photographer guy. He'd walk up to the cemetery, introduce himself, introduce us, talk to him, get the story. Then I'd ask, you know, who was buried here and all that. And then he'd say, do you mind if we take photos? Not one person that I sensed was uncomfortable about it. They were all so welcoming. I had people who said, first, let's, let's clean up, you know, and stuff like that. It just was a whole different way to approach the spectacular scene. And I had all these beautiful photos that, that, I, that I cherish that I felt good about. First night, I didn't. But that was the benefit of having a, a local guide. It's just this is just under the street for the army. This is the going to uh this was people. Now we're into the people. And this is just a kind of a combination of people and uh the culture. This is at one of the festivals. These are the Buddhists, uh the monks sitting up on the side and uh it's really um just enjoying the show. And I, I like the picture. It was funny though. We had, we all, we had very Fanny. She was from Hong Kong, and you know, we tried to be very respectful and stay our own deal. Fanny was intrepid. I mean, so they have these. This was going up into the the, the um, zone. These stairs going up here, and this is where all the llamas and all that are up in this thing. And so that's not. We're off limits a little bit there. We're not supposed to go there. So I'm sitting there taking pictures of the monk. And I look up, and right up here at the very top of the stairs, positioned herself with the camera taking pictures was Fanny. So, <laughs> and it was funny. I thought that was funny because just, but nobody cared. And it, it what's amazing too about this was with Richard um, Ianson. And the beauty of going on the photo tour is, is this we got access to things 
that nobody else gets to. And we were invited into these things, but what was really incredible, and I don't know if I have any pictures up here, but we got invited backstage to where they prepared. And we got to see them as they're coming in. We got to see them, they're getting dressed. We got to see them going out. And it was a whole different world. It was access that no one else was granted, but we were because Richard had arranged that. We went into, they have nunneries in Bhutan, the Buddhist nunneries, and you can go visit those. But the one thing that's off limits are the prayer services. And, but we got invited to go in and to, into two different nunneries, and we got to go in there and see them do their prayers and the drum solos and, and all that. It was, it was just remarkable because they're all just beautiful, beautiful temples, and they're all doing this. But that's the nice thing about a tour I don't have to worry about that stuff. I get in a van, we go. And uh, the people, when you get to with people that you really know and trust, they're getting to the best places and they're setting you up. And it's amazing because Richard, um, this is what he does for a living. He's got books out. He, he's, I mean, he's published in, I don't know how many, uh, hundreds and hundreds of magazines and books. And um but he's always so solicitous. He always wants you to be on the deal. I I have this one photo. It's one of my favorites. And I don't know if you can see it. But it's this uh, Buddhist monk walking out of a vestibule and into the light. And I'll pass it around. And this was one, if you saw it, it was dark. And you couldn't even see anything. I could barely see a monk walking there. Richard came and got me. He said, John, set up here. Here's what you do. And talk me through it. And he said, and I got this black picture. And he said, no, trust me. And he and when I got in there, I brought up the exposure. And there was a spectacular picture of this monk walking out of this, this zone, this beautiful vestibule. It just was one of my favorite photos. Once again, this is street and culture. This is in Oaxaca, they have, it's amazing because they have celebrations that go all night long. And this is like a truck, and I think it's a local fire department's truck, and they have a band in there, and they have people, and they march to the streets, literally on the circuit, all night long with the band playing. <laughs> it's really hilarious. But it's, it's just so colorful and so beautiful. This is what I'm talking about in that I like the most about street. This was in an alleyway in Bangkok. And this is where they lived. And this gives you a chance to see, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, not the picture's amazing, but just the idea and the way they live and being invited to take the photos and sit there. It, it just, it's just so exciting. And, and, and I don't know, it's really love. I don't necessarily, the picture, I don't know, not going to win any technical awards, but by the same token, it's, do you have a question? Yeah, so when you, yeah, yeah. Oh. so when you're shooting these, and these are lovely, they're great in color, great exposure and everything, and you mentioned the one that's being passed around as when you shot it, your original file was just this massive darkness, so you're shooting everything with existing light, natural light, as you're seeing here. 100%. And then, and then pulling it up in their yeah. post-process. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Now here I had, I had probably, I think I was probably about 6,400 of my ISO right here. I mean, some ISO was up there ways. Yes. So um, thank God for denoising. <laughs> you know? um, but yes. Plus this was my new lens. My new 2.8, <laughs> so f2.8, and just kind of walking, walking down the streets. Here's a woman sitting in her in her kitchen. Ah, oh, this is one of my favorite. This was Namibia. Literally, we're on the side of the road, and this is this Himba girl, and she, this is what they do: is they have these little pots, these gourds, and she's selling them. I mean, they're nothing for. 500 miles, there's maybe one car every two or three days comes through here, and here she is selling pots at this intersection. <laughs> so I actually bought one of them. It's one of my prized things that I got there, but it's just kind of, 
I don't know. It's the adventure. It's, it's, this is what I'm talking about on the grave sites. I think Leslie put one in a lot better than this one. But this was Juan Pablo brought us in and we had met the people and got to know them and all that. And so it was a welcoming environment doing this this way. But it's 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 such a beautiful thing because the people they're at the grave sites, but they're joyous. They're having dinner, they're enjoying it. It's it's just it's just remarkable. And once you got away from the big, big, overwhelming main cemetery and you got into the smaller ones, it just was a whole different world. You really, really enjoyed it. This is La, La, La Catrina. And people, they love to dress up. And the pageantry during, uh, during the Day of the Dead is spectacular. If you ever get a chance, it's a short flight to Oaxaca. My bit of advice is go in a week in advance. Do not, and if you have to leave, leave right before the, the, you know, when everybody does it. But it's amazing because we were there eight days before the first. I mean, it was nothing but Wakanos. All people from from Oaxaca. We got photos everywhere. People, you know, we we're taking these incredible photos. And then the day before the start of the like the thirty first, <laughs> this was replaced by. Americans dressed as Katrina's. It was like it was flooded. But it's, you know, I was there, so I can't really say something. But from a photographic standpoint, sometimes timing, getting in advance, because a lot of these festivals and things in the cities, they start a week, week and a half before the actual um, event happens. This was, as I was talking about in Bhutan, this was um, the Black Hat Dance. They had we went from Zon to Zon to this one festival that they had. And each, all day long, there were different dances. And this is the black hat dance. This is a 220 pound monk right here. And look at how agile he is. It just was, it's just remarkable watching him do these dances. And each, what the, what the festival is, is the telling of a person's journey through life and through death. And I can't remember exactly right off hand, I have it in my book, um, what the black hat dance does, but it's 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 right before you go into the afterlife and they're garnering and everything's fighting the evil. And I hate to say it, but one of the main symbols throughout Bhutan is the phallus. And it's everywhere. It's on the side of buildings. It's everywhere. You look, and it's there. And they have, you have the dancers, the monks, but they also have monks that are dressed up in these like devil type costumes and all. And they're all carrying big phalluses running around. And it's really hilarious because they're fighting each other and going through that. But uh, this was just spectacular, the, the pageantry and all. This is the afterlife. And this is when they're expelling the evil and they're cleansing the people and getting them ready to go into wherever they go in in buddhist culture but uh that's what these dancers are doing is is they're the guardians of the i guess what we call purgatory the the mid ground between you know wherever you're going and wherever you've been this is just a himba neat thing about where we were where if you go into parts of Namibia, you're going into very tourist generated areas so you want to take photos or have before you take photos but they're going to let you know exactly how much money you need to pay to take the photos you know that's they're making a living i'm not going to question it where we went they were no tourists no one because we we're so far off the grid and they would um we would trade and we trade like tobacco cooking oil um you know, flour, things like that. And then they'd invite us into the, the village. And I had this incredible, they'd, they'd dance, they'd sing, they have this like two hour ceremony for us that we could photograph. And we just, we traded things for it. And I had this incredible photo of Leslie standing in the middle and all these Himba women that are dancing. It's, it's you know, I love it. Okay. I had to put this one in. These are my vaudevillian penguins. This was, 
in Antarctica. I took this just re uh, what about three, four weeks ago, and they were coming out and they were just in perfect step with each other. It looked like it's a vaudeville act. <laughs> so, a funny story. They haven't been in Antarctica. Penguins everywhere. So we were on an expedition ship, and we're photographers. Tell you, Leslie, if you ever ask Leslie to show you the uh, video, just breathtaking. They, um, we are on expedition ship, so we did zodiac landings twice a day, and then we go out and we go whale looking in boats. And um, I learned real quick. I've got these incredible photographs of all these like penguins chasing each other. These things. Every one of them, the penguins are covered in penguin poop. They live in these 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 um, colonies, and they're just covered in poop. You know, so what you have to do is catch them right after they come back in, because they go out, they clean up, and they're nice and white, like everybody's seeing black and white and all. But the story I was going to tell, and this is kind of the the nice things about doing photography tours. We were on um, a ship called the uh, the Sylvia Earl. And it's a naturalist ship, but I mean, when I say, I love, I should have put the photo up here. I've got this giant boat, which is not even a big cruise line, sitting there at the pier, and down below it, almost looks like a dinghy. It's so small. That was the boat we were on, the dinghy. <laughs> so, but it wasn't. It, it accommodated a hundred people, passengers. But it's a naturalist boat, so everybody on that were doctorates and and uh, were, were really talked about the history of Antarctica and, and it was really fascinating. But we went out, we had a photographer, we were as a group, there were seven of us. So we got our own Zodiac and we're going out in one bay and we're you know, looking for whales. And the lady that, so because, you know, our, our, we're the photographic group, we got the whale naturalist. This lady had been for over 20 years, has been studying and in the field studying whales her whole, you know, her whole life. And so she drove the boat. Well, we got into this bay and we came on two humpback whales. And for 20 minutes, those whales played with our boat. They would come up to us and then they dive under and they turn and they come up. The heads come out. And 20 minutes, they kept circling our boat. They were so close to us that the, the, um, the whale lady kept touching them. And that's how that's how close they were. And this, it was just breathtaking. It was just less. Let's say has a video on it. Just just watching it go on and on and on and on. And it was so special that after we got done and the whales finally took off, I turned around. The lady that was the whale expert, studying them all her life, sitting on the back of the Zodiac, crying hysterically, because it was. She said it was the most incredible experience she had had meeting with these whales before. So those are just kind of the reasons that I, that I like to do tours. This oh here he is right here. <laughs> one of the one of the whales coming up right next to our boat. Lots and lots and lots of pictures of uh this is my next trip. I'm gonna do a lot better job hopefully on the wildlife. I do like this one. This was in a sandstorm and it was uh uh, this giraffe. The giraffes are the funniest things in the world because it's like they pose for you. Everything that they stop and they look at you like this as they're looking at you. This is my one. This is the highlights are up pretty high on this. I got a photo. This was um, this year in Saskatoon, Canada. And, uh, you know, I probably shouldn't admit it, but what they do is these are wild, uh, wild snow owls. And they have a guy that's a wrangler kind of for him. And what he does is he goes out and starts in the November and he takes out mice. And then he kind of trains these um, snow owls that they come in and they see him release the mice and they fly in and get it. Well, I had ordered uh, my new 180 to 600 lens and it hadn't shown up yet. So I had um, up to 400, so I didn't get any birds in flight. But I did get some some good ones where... They're coming in and swooping and about to get the mice. I've got one where it's got its talons right around, but I figure it may be too graphic for some people, so I don't push it too much. But this was the highest temperature we saw was 36 below zero, and it was brutal. 
it was brutal and it was the that's not wind chill that's the temperature and it stuck every day it, we get in it's 40 degrees below zero every day and i kept thinking it was colder than that when we get started and i finally figured out that the car thermometer only went down to 40 below zero <laughs> so we get out we do our photos he set it up and we could only be out for two to three minutes and we had to be back in the in the car so pardon me Yes. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, it was brutal. It was brutal. So yeah, that's that's when I was up there. This was with a guy named Jim Zimmerman, and Jim Zimmerman's. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's been around for years and years and years. I've got a book in there. He does um one of my little vanity books. He does a macro photography thing in, in Kansas City every year. And and he has a guy that raises exotic, um, you know, frogs and lizards and snakes and things like that. And he sets up displays and you come in and do macro photography. It just is a blast to do that. But this was also with Jim. So the reasons I do, I like to do travel and tours is these are the things that we've been talking about. Um, oh, the third one that I have not talked about was kind of interesting. I did it. This was a la um, in Iceland. This is the first time I'd ever done this. Was I don't know if you've heard of Mads Peter Iverson. He's big YouTube. Yeah. He has, which is amazing, he has this Google Maps you can do of Iceland. And I downloaded it. And what's really amazing is he has a YouTube video on each location. So you can sit down there map out, this is where I want to go, then you can watch a YouTube video, and he talks about how to approach it and, and how to get the best pictures and when to do it. And it's you've got your own little tour going. It's the only place I've ever felt good going that I was able to get to places I wanted to go, and just was incredible. I think he's doing it, he's done it for Scotland too, and some places like that. Have you met him? Have you? No. Yeah. Well, I will tell you a funny story. And this was about, pardon me? No. Oh, oh, this is about my evolution as a um, feeling comfortable as a photographer. You know, every time I get critiques, you know, I always kind of, oh no, and get start getting embarrassed and things. I got lucky. One of the things I like to do is go with tour leaders that are specialists in a location. And funny story, because I, I got a, 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 a email popped up and it was from uh, Nigel Danson. And he said, I'm going to do a, a five-day workshop at my house in the Lake District for four photographers. So whoever is interested, let me know. So I looked at Leslie and said, this just came up. I'm doing it. Do you want to go? She said, give me a few minutes to think about it. I said, okay, fine. I'm going. So I hit it. 15 minutes later, she goes, yeah, I want to go. Sold out. Sorry. But... The thing that was kind of interesting, uh, Nigel Dance and I was kind of a little apprehensive because you know he's got like a million followers, and so I thought, you know, what's this guy going to be like? Probably one of the nicest, most genuinely w nice people that I've met. Just was very solicitous, took the time. It didn't feel, I, I, I don't know, I just felt comfortable there with him. Um, but here's when I figured out that maybe I was starting to feel comfortable with my photography. We take the same photo. We had like this, this, I mean, it was identical. It was like a boathouse on the side of the, the, um, the lake and it had all this fog around it. It's a beautiful photo. And I go in there and man, I jack up the color. I jack up the kind I make it look like, ow. And his is muted and, you know, just kind of surreal. And he looks at it and says, John, that looks horrible. And I said, I said, Nigel, I think yours does too. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed. He said, yeah, I see, because that's what I like. And I was okay. And I, here I was telling Nigel Dance, and hey, sorry, this is what I like and I'm comfortable with it. So I really felt good. And that was kind of a um, thing for me. But that, um, oh, I went the wrong way. Photo tour, some of the things that, our advantages. I've been, wow, it's just some incredible photographers that just are so genuine and so, you know, they just go out of their way to be with you. And there's some, like, you know, like I said, Richard Ianson, 
he's known throughout the country. He's like real good buddies with Art Wolf and they travel together. And, you know, he, he is a, I think the highest, they have like some award they give him in Australia and he has achieved the highest award on that. But man, he just is nice the guy and gives and gives and gives of himself and, you know, follows up and, you know, he follows me on Instagram and is always commenting on my photos and things like that. But it, it's nice going with someone like that that you get to a point where you start feeling, I'm not his level, let's be honest, but I'm feeling I'm okay sitting with him. My photography is good enough and things like that. Um, everything's planned. It's done. You get in the van, you go. And, you know, it's just, they say, hey, we're going to be here. We've got access to uh, this festival. We got, we're going to be here at this location that I've scouted out before for sunrise. Um, everything's thought out, planned. Even my walks that we did in, in Bangkok, where it was, they knew where to go. I went with local photographers and we knew where to go, where to go to be in these different things. We had, uh, I worked with two different photographers in Bangkok, which is interesting because they had totally different styles. One was night photography and um, Chinatown. And we did a lot of that photography. The other one was really fascinating. His name's um, Tim Russell. And he's put out a couple books, but he took us, and I hate to use a term, but that's what they use is, is the Bangkok slums. And we started in the wet markets. And that's where they, you know, when I say wet markets is where they're chopping up cows and goats and selling stuff like that. And we went from that. Then we went into the, the Bangkok slums. And he, he says to us, he says, you're, fa you're fine, you're safe. Um, he said, most people in Bangkok will not come in this location. And it was so incredible because the people... Everywhere we'd been in Bangkok, these were the most welcoming people, the nicest people, the incredible photos. But we would have never gone there if it hadn't been for using a local expert. And that was just, just incredible. Um, finally, everything is geared towards photography. It's not a, hey, we're going to go shopping or going to the outlet mall today. Then we'll stop and get some photos here. This is a photography trip. You're set up, you're set up so you have download time, you set up for, uh, you know, processing time, you set up, we all get together and do some processing, you're set up for your photo shoots. It's exhausting, it really is. But man, you walk out with, you know, four or 5,000 photos and just, it's just incredible. Disadvantages, to be honest, they're not cheap. Some of these things are very expensive. Um, <clears throat> itinerary is not very flexible. So it's <laughs> for, Everything I say about the advantage is being it's not flexible. It's your phot photography is also, man, you're going. You get tired, it's too bad. You know, you, you can miss your photo shoot, sleep if you want to, but which Leslie does occasionally. It, she always likes the hotels with massages in them. So, um, and also everything is geared towards uh, photography. So if you're there for other cultural experiences, you want to add some days before and after. And typically, and once again, it depends on the trip because most of them are pretty immersive. Selecting a tour, and this is important. And this is something that I learned. One thing, I do not go on a tour if I can't talk to that, that photographer. If I can't get on a Zoom call, see how I feel. Number two, I look at their photography. I mean, I cannot tell you how many photographers I've looked at there. Oh, we're going to India. We're going here. And you look at their photography and you're going, oh my God, are you kidding me? You know, you're running trips. I'm sorry, that's, that's rude. But you look at it and you think if your photography doesn't match up with their photography, it's not worth going because we all have our own styles and you want to find people that have similar styles to which, which you like and or or an experience that you're really looking for. Um, so does it does their photographic style match your photographic style? Or more important, is it a style you want to try? There's unbelievable. There's um, Nick Page. You heard of Nick Page? Yeah. He has this thing that I've been trying to get on for a while where he goes to the Oregon coast. And it's like 1500 bucks or something like that or 2000 bucks. But that's it. That's you're paying for Nick. 
because you rent your own car. You don't know where you're going to be. You're doing the Oregon coast and you're chasing storms and you're looking for the most dramatic seascapes. And he does it for, for a week. And man, I would want to do that so bad. But this guy is a master in, in uh, post-processing too. I'm going um, next year uh, uh, with a photographic group on tornadoes up to Tornado Alley. And it's for a week. You go and you're chasing tornadoes to do photographs on that. And I got a feeling that's going to end up being more beer drinking than his photography. <laughs> it's funny because all the people that are coming in are coming in from Australia. They're coming in from all these other places. And I think they have this idea that it's just going to be like tornado, 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 tornado. You know, it's like I was talking to one of the leaders and I said, you do realize we could get here and there could not be a tornado for the whole week. And he said, no. <laughs> yeah, but, um, Things that you want to experience, you get to know the culture, you look at it, what is it that they have? What are they offering? It's different people have different things. It's 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 hard to say, but like I wanted to go do festival photography and I wanted to do it with the best. And this is the guy that did the Himalayas for Netflix series and things like that. So that's something I wanted to do. Um, you want to find out what kind of experience I had like I said, we've done tons of tours and I've got a bunch more coming up. Um, I've got a guy going on three tours with, uh, I met him. I met him actually, it's funny because we were just in the Atacama Desert about a month ago and I, I booked two trips with this guy and I had never met him. And all of a sudden he comes walking in with the tour group <laughs> and at a hotel we're staying in the Atacama Desert in Chile. I mean, that's how strange is that? But he won. He, this year, if you look at, uh, they have the travel photographers, like the big, big, big photo competition every year with tens of thousands of entries. He won for, there's this beautiful photo of the white sands with a person going through. He won that category. And I was talking to him and he said, yeah, I'm a little ticked. He said, the first time I haven't won the series contest with him. So this, this guy is really good, but I think he's a little disorganized though. So we'll see, but I'm pretty excited because we're going to Ecuador with him and I'm going to the five stands and going to China. We're doing a full month tour and we're, and literally we've only got two days in Shanghai and that's the last big city we'll see. So it's, it's kind of exciting. Um, I had one, this is always talk, zoom talk. I'll have a talk with a person. My um, trip to Oaxaca, it was a disaster. It was, I, I, in fact, I tried to get with the, the tour leader. She was out of Germany and I said, hey, you know, we'd love to talk. I always had an excuse why she couldn't Zoom talk. It was, now the trip was magnificent because it was so much. We had to, you know, participate in those. Then we got Juan Pablo that took us to some places. Then we did our own things. And there were some things. We have a, a photo shoot. In fact, the photo I entered in the, um, this month was an actual photo shoot, which I've never done before, but as a Katrina with the, the lights and all that. And I actually kind of enjoyed this stage photo shot. That's not something I've done a lot of, um, but that's one thing I did do is good, but I wish I had talked to her in advance. I would have known better on her. Once again, local photographers, but here's the interesting thing is Oh, that's the way he's talking about Mads. Um, travel photography is anything. It can be Bartlett. It can be, you know, it's the, the rodeos going someplace to do. It's the culture. It's things like that. It doesn't have to be, you know, Ecuador. It doesn't have to be Chile. It doesn't have to be Antarctica. It can be anything. There are tours everywhere, local people. It's, there's a couple of local photographers that do, you know, tours that are like in the hill country and do bird tours and things like that. So kind of interesting. Okay, so close it out. What's next? So I'm finally feeling comfortable to enter some photos, which is a big jump for me putting them in. And then I'll never forget that the first, I think I won't forget, Gary did a critique on one of my photos on Iceland when I first joined it. That was all you know, I was always going, what's she saying? What's she saying? And all this. And I, I wasn't upset, but I was kind of like embarrassed and all that. And I said, it's one of my favorite photos. And I put it up. And about a month later, I pulled the photo out and looked at it. And said, oh, I see what he was saying. <laughs> but it's, it's, 
now at a point where I enjoy criticism because it's helping me grow. I, I um, have been processing some photos and some of them like with uh, when you're doing the scenes, like the butchers, maybe the you know chicken feet are a little out of focus, but the guy, the butcher's up there. So guess what I started doing? Darkening up the focus part. That was from Patrick. I thought that was great, but it's 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 amazing and and the things that I'm feeling comfortable now starting to show things. I never anytime I put my photo in there, I I don't put a price on them because I I don't feel comfortable selling things yet. But some of the things that I, I have been doing is I'm starting to enter in some of the photo contests, and then I do on try to do on each one of the trips is I do a vanity book. And this is just for me. These things are not cheap, but I do it for us. And then I send it to like relatives and things like that. Um, this is what I'm starting to do is each one of the trips is I'm trying to do a theme and I'm building a little portfolio that I print out so that when I have an opportunity maybe to go, someone says, okay, well, I'll look at you doing a show. I can take my different things and look at them so they can look and say, hey, I like this. This is the kind of direction we went or not. Or, hey, here's, I'd like these six photos that we can put in there. And then finally, I don't know if I'll do this again, but this is kind of interesting. This is something called, uh, Amazon has what they call KDP, which is a publishing where it, you can publish anything. And they'll publish it. You know, you have to come up and you have to do a... Um, so I use something called Affinity Publisher, and I'm not very good, as you can see, by, you know, setup and things, but there are ways, and you, you write your book, you set it up, and then you upload it into Amazon, and they, um, then they help you, they have all these tools to help you, and then they help you design your cover, and then they publish it, and they sell it on Amazon, and this right here, the publishing cost is right at $5.00 for a photo book. Now, let's, let's be honest. The, the resolution between the vanity book and this are night and day, but it's fun. And I, what I did is I tried to do a travel stories and things like this, and then they sell it for $19.99 is what I put it on at. And I end up actually getting like $10 of that. So I think I've got a whopping four sales so far. So, um, but this is fun because this is something that you're doing with your work. And it's not hard to do. And that's kind of it. So, but that's it. I'm I'm starting to enter maybe some shows and some contests. I will say one thing funny is from that I told you the story about my at the photo show I did at Damon Carter Museum. Well, one of the photos I took was of the De Fort Worth Water Gardens. So, if you've seen that, but Damon Carter dedicated that to the city of uh, Fort Worth, and I got a call like the day after the show. And I answered and I said, uh, he says, is this John Chatham? And I said, yeah. And he says, this, this is Eamon Carter. And I don't know if you know who Eamon Carter is, but he, he like owned full star telegram. The guy was on the, the cover of Time Magazine. You know, he was a big deal. Uh, the Kimball Art Museum, the Eamon Carter Museum, all those were, he donated to Fort Worth. So he was a, he was a big deal. Um, and I said, I thought he was joking first. He said, yes, sir. And he said, can I buy that photo from you? of the water gardens. And I thought, wow, yeah, of course, you know, so I think he gave me a hundred dollars for it, but you know, that was 40 years ago, 45 years ago. So, you know, maybe that was a decent thing, but he paid for it. But the cool thing was on the, I think it was Time Magazine's one with the photos, they, they had a story on Eamon Carter and he was on the cover and he's sitting at his desk and the desk is covered and literally right behind him was my photograph. <laughs> and so I've been on Time Magazine front cover. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> no. Yeah. No, I just... oh, John, yes. what is your camera? What kind of lenses do you usually take with you? Yeah. I mean, you're traveling and you're walking and what it's, do you usually use? Well, now I've got, I, I've got a Nikon. I, I have, um, I carry my, my camera is a Z8 and then I have a Z7 backup camera. So I always carry a backup camera with me. And I finally invested in the 24 to 70 and the 7200 F 2.8 lenses. Those things are remarkable for street photography, especially those things are remarkable. Then I, I just bought 
a uh, 180 to 600. So those are my primary. I have a 14 to 30. So each trip, it depends on what the trip is. But I'll take all four of those with me when I go on um, like the Nanibia and stuff because you're going all different directions. But like Leslie right now, we have macro lenses. We've got a 105 and a 50 macro. So for when we do some of the, the macro work and close up. So it just depends on the trip. But generally, it's those four lenses. So thank you. Well, thank you all very much. So, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Hold, hold on. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, happy. I'm just sorry. <laughs> no, we're not done yet. Uh, okay. And that's enough about gear. Um, <laughs> you said that you put your camera away for some time. What prompted you to pick it up again? I just love photography. I always have. I went down, um, had a chance to go and uh, live in, in the mountains in Guatemala for three months when I was 24. Um, and so I went down there and I took my cameras with me and uh, for photography. And I've always back and forth, back and forth. I've still got my old Nicromats. I love my Nicromats. In fact, I just bought two Rolleflexes. And so that's, if I'm going to try to make the Bartlett chisel, I'll do it. I'm going to bring my black and white for the Rolleflex and give that a try. So thanks. So that's, that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. I don't know if I hear that one. Is that on? I think so. Uh, well, thank you very much for. Oh, yeah, you can set that down. And uh, that's the end of our meeting, the recorded part of the meeting. Um, we can stay around and talk for the next 45 minutes or whatever as we shut stuff down. But uh, I guess that the next meeting, I've got all the judges now. Uh, will be on May 2nd, and it'll be one of the competition meetings. So I guess we'll end the meeting now. <laughs>